Chapter 66 The waiting area in the Diagnostic Imaging Department at Colshaw Hospital was busy and running late. Jan and Chris had been making conversation, but now he was answering messages on his phone while Jan sipped from the water bottle she had brought with her, watching the comings and goings of the department. The instruction sheet for the scan had stated to drink two to three glasses of water before the scan. Jan was following these instructions, as she had followed all the antenatal advice. She had been sipping the water at home, during the car journey here, and was now finishing the second bottle. She hoped she didn't have to wait long, as her bladder felt uncomfortably full. She glanced at Chris, and then at the woman sitting opposite, whose partner was also concentrating on his phone. The woman met her gaze, and threw her a knowing smile, which Jan returned. She had found a camaraderie among pregnant women that was reassuring, like joining a support group. Jan had been very worried when she'd been told she would need another scan. Although the nurse had reassured her there was nothing to worry about and the baby was fine, the fact that it was very active showed how healthy it was. She had been able to feel it kicking and moving at fourteen weeks, with little bulges appearing in her stomach wall. A nurse appeared. Jan Hamlin, you're next. Jan immediately stood. So did Chris. This is my partner, Jan said to the nurse. It was important he felt included. This way, please, the nurse said, with a warm, professional smile. How are you both? Fine, thank you, Jan said. And how's the father-to-be? She asked, looking at Chris. A bit nervous, he admitted. Like all dads are. She showed them into one of the scan rooms, closed the door and asked Jan to lie on the couch. Jan knew the routine from the previous scans. Chris helped her onto the couch and then drew up a chair to sit beside her. Jan pulled down the top of her trousers and pants to expose her stomach, now showing a reasonable-sized baby bulge, of which she was proud. The gel can feel a bit cold, the nurse said as she squirted some onto Jan's stomach. Jan turned her head so she could see the monitor as the nurse began moving the transducer over her stomach, up and down and around, pressing on her full bladder. Chris was concentrating on the screen too. He had a better view, sitting rather than lying as she was. While they had been delighted by the first scan, proof she was pregnant, it hadn't really shown much. A pulsing, indistinct image of a developing fetus with an oversized head, lying on its back in a dark uterus. This scan was far more detailed. The room was silent, except for an irregular click, as the nurse took photos of what she was seeing on screen. Jan glanced from the screen to the nurse. Her expression was one of concentration. Jan could see the image of her baby clearly, but had no idea what the nurse was making of it. How far gone are you? she asked. Eighteen weeks, I think, Jan replied. The nurse moved the transducer to a different position on Jan's stomach. Chris gave her hand a squeeze. He was holding it quite tightly as he too concentrated on the screen. Is everything all right? he asked after a moment. It's a boy, the nurse replied. That's great, Jan said and could see from Chris's expression how pleased he was. I'd like the doctor to check something, the nurse said, and put down the transducer. It's nothing to worry about. What is it? Chris asked, immediately anxious. Just a precaution. Stay here, please, while I fetch a more senior colleague. She hurried out of the room. Jan looked at Chris and saw his fear. It can't be much, she said. I can feel him moving, and the images looked fine to me. But this didn't happen with your last scan, Chris said anxiously. I know, but it does happen. I joined an online forum for mums-to-be, and a lot of women were worried when second opinions were sought. The nurses do it to cover themselves. I had to have my urine double-checked at the doctor's when I was first pregnant. You didn't tell me that, Chris said, no less worried. There was nothing to tell. 
I gave another sample and everything was okay. It happens. I'm sure your son is fine. Chris's face gave way to a small smile at the mention of his son. You're probably right. Sorry. I'm not very good at this, am I? You're doing okay, Jan said. But as the minutes ticked by, she began to share Chris's concern. What was taking the nurse so long? Was she discussing what she'd found before coming back into the room? Could it be so bad that it had to be discussed away from them? The door abruptly opened, and the nurse returned with a colleague. Hello, I'm Dr. Carter, a consultant radiologist here, he said. Sorry to have kept you waiting. We're very busy today. He threw them a reassuring smile and then began looking at the recorded images on the screen. Jan and Chris watched him carefully as he clicked the mouse to move from one image to the next. The nurse pointed to some areas on the photos, and Jan assumed that was in relation to what was causing the problem and that it had already been discussed outside of the room. Chris gave her hand another reassuring squeeze as the consultant turned to them. You have a son. Congratulations, he said. Your baby's heart and lungs are fine. He's a little on the small side, but will probably make it up. You're eating well and taking plenty of fluids? Yes, Jan said. He appears to have a slight irregularity in the formation of his feet, but it's nothing to worry about and can be fixed with an operation once he's born. An irregularity? Is it serious? Chris asked. It doesn't appear to be. You've heard of a club foot. It's similar to that. What caused it? Jan asked. We don't really know, but it is correctable. We'll keep an eye on it and scan again in four weeks. Should we be worried? Jan asked. No, it's minor. He smiled and touched her arm reassuringly. I'll leave you with the nurse now. With another smile, he left the room. Better to be safe than sorry, the nurse said brightly. How many photos would you like? Three, please, Jan said, while Chris said nothing and looked deep in thought. Chapter 67 The following morning, Chris stopped by Lillian's store on his way to work. He didn't want to buy anything, but he needed to talk to her. He waited as she finished serving a customer and then stepped forward. Lovely to see you, she said. Everything okay? Jan was in here yesterday. How did the scan go? It's a boy, Chris said proudly. I've brought a scan photo to show you. He took the photo from his pocket and handed it to her. Wonderful. Congratulations, Lillian said, genuinely pleased. Thank you. What's the matter? You seem worried. Does he look all right to you? Chris asked. I mean, I know the image isn't wonderful, but does he look like a baby should at 18 weeks? I didn't go with Camille for her scan, so I've got no idea. Yes, of course. Why shouldn't he? The doctor said he isn't as big as he should be, so they're going to scan again in four weeks. It happens, Lillian said stoically. When I was expecting my youngest, I was told the same. He was eight pounds when he was born. They catch up. That's what the doctor said, but they also think he may need an operation on his feet. It seems there's an irregularity in the formation of his feet. Lillian peered more closely at the photo. Well, I suppose they know what they're talking about, but I can't see much wrong. She looked up. Like a club foot? Chris added. Well, that's not serious, is it? I don't think so. She held his gaze. Chris, the baby looks fine to me. Stop worrying. I know you struggled after what happened to you and Camille, but that won't happen again. Very few pregnancies are completely straightforward. There's always something. I know, I've had four. Blood pressure too high, too much fluid, baby too small, not in the right position, and so on. If there's something wrong, it's correctable. So buck up. Jan needs you. She handed back the photo. 
Yes, you're probably right. Although Jan seems to be taking it better than me. That's understandable. She's a woman. Lillian smiled. Which reminds me, Chris said. Jan has asked if you can come for supper this Saturday. I'll check with Jim, but I'm sure that's fine. The door opened as another customer came in. I'll be off then. See you Saturday? Around seven? Chris said. Look forward to it. Give my love to Jan. Chapter 68 Chris returned to his van. He really must get a move on now. He was halfway through rewiring a house in the next village and had finished early yesterday to take Jan for the scan. Now he was late. He texted the couple to say he would be with them soon with apologies. After a restless night, he'd needed the sound voice of reason from Lillian and she'd done her best. He started the van but didn't drive off. He stared through the windscreen deep in thought. If Jan was worried, she wasn't showing it. Probably for his sake, he decided. Engine still running, he took the scan photo from his pocket. Pity he didn't have a digital copy that he could have enlarged, but that hadn't been offered at the hospital. He supposed he could ask for another, but Jan would want to know the reason especially if there was already another scan scheduled in four weeks' time. Returning the photo to his pocket, he drove away. It wasn't so much his son's low weight that was worrying him. The doctor, nurse, Jan's online friends and now Lillian all agreed that babies usually made up any shortfall in their weight before birth. No, what was really worrying Chris was the malformation of his baby's feet. He told himself he was anxious because their child could be left with a limp or possibly never walk at all. That's what he kept telling himself, but it wasn't true. A lay-by appeared and Chris pulled over. Cutting the engine, he took the scanned photo and his phone from his pocket. He propped the photo on the steering wheel and then accessed the internet on his phone. He put Club Foot into a search engine and soon learned that the term covered a number of conditions. Photos and X-rays appeared alongside articles. He glanced between the images on his phone and the scan photo of his baby, comparing them. There were some similarities, but there were also many differences. The lower leg bones seemed longer in the scan photo of his baby than those of a human child, even allowing for the malformation, although he couldn't be sure. He searched again, this time using the more general leg and foot deformities in an unborn baby. Pages of links to websites appeared, medical, research and forums. He read the information and compared the images. One research paper said that this type of deformity crossed ethnic groups and could be found in some animals, especially primates, which didn't reassure Chris at all. There were pictures of developing fetuses in the uterus, and in the early stages most species looked very similar. This is because fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds and humans carry very similar ancient genes, he read with another stab of fear. He returned to the information on club feet and possible causes, not caused by the fetus's position in the womb. Often the cause is unknown. Genetic factors are believed to be involved. Specific gene changes have been associated with it. Can be passed down through families. He went cold. But this had nothing to do with the Moller Clinic, he told himself. It couldn't. Jan's parents lived over a hundred miles away and had never used the clinic. Jan and he didn't look alike, as he and Camille did, so it couldn't be history repeating itself. It was his paranoia. Simply, it was bad luck that their baby had a malformation of his feet, but it wasn't uncommon and could be easily corrected with surgery, just as the doctor had said. Returning the scanned photo and phone to his pocket, Chris started the van and continued to drive to work, desperately trying to believe 
that what he was telling himself was true. Chapter 69 Ian Jennings Speaking It's Chris Giles Hi, how are you? I'm fine, and yourself? Not bad. We sold our house, but Emma and I are still in touch. I'm sorry to trouble you, but... Chris paused and took a deep breath. God, he hoped he was doing the right thing. I need to ask you something, and I'd appreciate it if you kept it to yourself. Sure, what is it? Sounds a bit ominous. Ian tried a small laugh. Hopefully it's nothing. I think you may know that I'm in a relationship with Jan Hamlin, who used to be the tenant at Ivy Cottage. Yes, Anne mentioned it. We're expecting a baby. Congratulations. Thank you. Chris paused again and steeled himself to ask the question. Ian, do you still have the records for the Moller Clinic? No, I don't. After I emailed all those on the list, I deleted all my records, just in case the police came knocking on my door. I see. But you emailed everyone on the list first? Chris asked. Yes. Some were old email addresses and the email bounced back, so I did my best to trace them. I guess a few of the emails might have gone into junk mail, but there was no way of following that up. Why? Our baby has a slight deformity of his feet that could be genetic. I guess I'm overreacting, but I was going to ask you to check to make sure Jan's parents weren't on the list. There, he'd said it. Chris thought. He'd voiced his worst fear. If Jan didn't receive an email, then you can assume they weren't, Ian replied. That's what I thought. Thank you. Sorry to disturb your evening. No problem. I can understand why you're worried after what happened to us. But I'm sure it's fine. Yes, thanks. It was 9.30pm and Jan was already upstairs. She was often tired in the evening now and went up to bed before him. She'd left her laptop on the coffee table, charging. Chris looked away, back again. Then picking it up, he lifted the lid. It sprang into life. It wasn't password protected. Jan said she didn't have any secrets from him, so she saw no need for passwords on her laptop or phone. He hesitated, and then continued. Ian had said that some of the emails he'd sent had gone to old email addresses. Chris knew that Jan had an old email account she never used. How often did she check it? He had no idea. He followed the icon to the old mailbox, and his mouth went dry. There were dozens of unopened emails from stores, holiday companies, websites where she was a customer, offering special offers at least two a week, sometimes more. Chris began scrolling down, last week, last month, last year. Checking each email, he found a couple she might want to keep and left them, right back to December. He saw it and went cold. The email from Carsten Moller Ian had sent. The subject line, confidential and urgent. With his heart thumping, Chris forced himself to open the email, hoping against all the odds that it was something else entirely. All hope vanished as he read. I'm sorry to inform you that there has been a dreadful mistake at the Moller Clinic, resulting in too many patients receiving the same donor sperm. If you are planning to start a family, you should have your DNA tested as a matter of urgency, to make sure you don't share the same biological father as your partner. Regards, Carsten Boller. A buzzing noise filled Chris's ears, and the room swam before him. Jan's parents must have used the clinic and never told her. 
he felt sick, and bile rose in his throat. History was repeating itself. First Camille and now Jan. His worst nightmare was coming true. Anne had told him some time ago that while most of those who shared Moller's genes looked very similar, not all did. What were the odds of this happening to him again? He couldn't believe it. He held his head in his hands. They were half-brother and sister, just as he and Camille were. He could cope with anything, but not losing Jan. He loved her and wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. There never could or would be anyone else. Ian and Emma had been able to move on, but he knew he couldn't. He was older than them and had been through this before. Without Jan, he was nothing. He couldn't risk losing her. She believed their baby had a small malformation of his feet and it would stay that way for as long as possible. Blinking back tears, Chris deleted the email and then, closing the laptop, telephoned Anne. I need to talk to you urgently. It's about Jan and our baby. Chapter 70 If you really want a home birth, then it's fine with me, Jan said, kissing Chris's cheek. It's not a problem. Although, shouldn't I still go for the next scan? No need, Chris said. Anne can do it at home here. She's highly experienced and has all the equipment she needs, including a portable ultrasound scanner. I'll feel much happier with Anne taking care of you after what happened to Camille. Jan looked at him with compassion. But what happened to Camille was very different. I know, but things can still go wrong, and if they do, Anne is the best person to deal with it. She saw his sadness and concern. Chris, I think you're worrying unnecessarily, unless there's something you're not telling me. Of course there isn't. It's simply that Anne is the best. Okay, Jan agreed. You'll like her, Chris persisted. I know you didn't think much of her when you first met her in Colshaw Woods, but that was because you thought I was seeing her. You haven't really got to know her. She's a fantastic midwife and a good friend of mine. So you keep telling me. And I've got nothing against Anne. But what will happen if the birth isn't straightforward and I need to go to hospital? I'm sure that won't be necessary. But Anne can advise you. She'll be with you every step of the way until you give birth. I'll be there too, of course, he added. You'd better be, Jan laughed, lightly tapping his arm. I'm not doing this alone. You won't have to. Whatever happens in the future, I'll be there for you. And for our baby, Jan added, you'll be there for our son. Yes, of course. Chapter 71 Three months later, Jan was at home with the back door open gazing out on another beautiful sunny morning. The chickens Chris kept were in their coop at the very bottom of the garden, clucking. Anne had just left, having given her another routine check-up. She was being very well looked after, and Jan felt guilty for ever having thought badly of Anne. She was a fantastic midwife, just as Chris had said. Patient, kind, caring, and with a very reassuring manner. She dispelled any fears Jan had about having the baby at home. She was also a lovely person, who Jan now regarded as a friend. If she thought Anne was slightly evasive about the problem with the baby's feet, she put it down to her not wanting to worry her. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, she said in her quiet, confident way, so that Jan found herself reassured. Anne had taken care of all the arrangements that needed to be made for Jan to have a home birth and had updated the hospital records accordingly. Her manner was always pleasant and empathetic, instilling confidence and a sense of well-being, just what a first-time mother needed. 
Anne never spoke about her other work, looking after the outsiders, although she knew Jan had been told. Once Jan had asked about them, and Anne had replied that she probably wouldn't be needed for much longer, as the numbers were falling now the clinic had been exposed. But that was all she'd said, and Jan didn't ask again. Chris didn't speak of the outsiders either, although Jan knew he visited Anne at Ivy Cottage sometimes, if she needed help. Jan trusted Chris just as she trusted Anne. Now she understood what had created and cemented their friendship. Jan sometimes walked along Wood Lane if the weather was good, but she'd never seen the children again. Their secret remained safe with her, as she'd promised Camille and Chris it would. The Moller clinic had been closed down and Castor Moller was in prison. She had seen it on the news. Jan was about to go outside into the warm sunshine when a sharp pain shot across her abdomen and lower back. Trying to catch her breath, she grabbed the door to steady herself and waited for it to pass. Whatever was that? Not chronic indigestion, not that bad. And it was too early for labour. She still had another nine weeks to go. Perhaps she should phone Anne for advice. The pain struck again, tearing through her like a red-hot knife, making her cry out. It was like nothing she'd ever experienced before. She held on to the door and prayed it would pass. A moment later, she felt a gush of warm fluid as her waters broke. Oh no, please no! Panic gripped her. She was going into labour early. What should she do? She needed Chris. She had to call him now. Where was her phone? She turned and saw it on the sofa. Letting go of the door, she made her way across the room. Another contraction took hold and she froze, paralysed with pain until it had passed. No one had told her it would be this bad, and it wasn't supposed to be happening yet. She had been told first babies were often late, not early. She needed to sit down. Her legs felt weak, but her jeans were sopping wet. Beyond caring, she lowered herself onto the sofa and then called Chris. It went through to voicemail. Shit. She tried again. He was at work, but checked his phone regularly. She tried one more time with the same result, and then, unable to keep the desperation from her voice, left a message. Chris, I think I'm in labour. Come quickly, please. I'll call Anne. But I need you here. She braced herself as another contraction took hold and tried to remember her deep breathing. It didn't help but eventually the pain eased. Surely the contractions were coming too regularly for the first stage of labour. Fumbling with her phone, she called Anne. It rang and rang. Please answer, please. Don't leave me here all alone. I might die. It continued ringing, and then mercifully Anne answered. You have to come back straight away, Jan cried. I'm in labour. The contractions are coming every minute. Are you sure? That's too soon. Have you timed them? No, but I don't need a bloody clock to know. I'm in agony. My waters have broken. I'm scared, Anne. Please come. Chris isn't picking up. Please. I'm... But the sentence vanished into a cry as another contraction took hold. I'm on my way, Anne said. It'll take me about ten minutes. Try to calm down and remember your breathing. It's possible it's a false start. But to be safe, I want you to go upstairs and lie on your bed. Put some towels down first to protect the covers. I'll be there. Should I call an ambulance? Jan wept. No, absolutely not. And for the first time since Jan had known Anne, she heard anxiety in her voice. Chapter 72 Chris was driving as fast as the country roads would allow and fearing the worst. He'd been up a ladder at the house he was working in when his phone had rung. He'd finished what he was doing before coming down, never dreaming it could be Jan in labour. 
when he'd listened to her message, he'd immediately phoned her. She hadn't answered, and then when he'd called Anne straight after, neither had she. He now tried them again as he drove, but voicemail cut in on both their phones. God, he was worried, and blamed himself for not checking his phone sooner. He knew that these babies were born earlier than others, but there'd been no sign of labour beginning that morning. Nor when he'd called Jan at 9am, when he'd just arrived at work. Anne was supposed to be visiting her for a check-up, and had said she'd phone him straight after, but that hadn't happened. He was sure something had gone badly wrong, or Anne would have been in touch. He accelerated, and then had to brake hard as a car rounded the bend. The driver sounded his horn angrily as he passed. Calm down, Chris told himself. Only another two miles to go. Usually the birth of these babies was straightforward, Anne had reassured him. But not always, he thought, as he and Camille had found out. Supposing Jan needed to go to hospital, possibly for a caesarean. It was the only procedure Anne couldn't carry out at home. It had never happened before when Anne had been the midwife, but there was a first time for everything. What if Owen, as they'd named him, couldn't be born naturally? He was larger than most of these babies. Chris's heart clenched as he remembered the look of horror on the faces of the nurses when Camille had given birth. And now it was happening again, only much later in the pregnancy, which made it a whole lot worse. Questions were sure to be asked at the hospital and their secret exposed. Anne would be struck off and Owen, and the others like him, would be taken away to a life of hell. The very thing they'd strived and managed to avoid for so long was about to happen. Chris was devastated. He made a sharp right turn into his road, and his heart stopped. An ambulance was parked outside his house. So was Anne's car. Jan was being taken to hospital. His worst fear had come true. Anne would never have called for an ambulance unless it was serious, life-threatening. Jan's life was in danger. He could lose her. Coming to an abrupt halt in front of the ambulance, Chris jumped out. As he passed the ambulance, he saw the rear doors were open, but there was no one inside. The front door to his house was wide open, and he ran in. Jan! He shouted at the top of his voice. Up here, Anne returned. He took the stairs two at a time and went into their bedroom. The room seemed full. Jan was being helped into a wheelchair by one of the paramedics, while the other held a bundle in his arms. Jan, my love, he cried, going to her. I'm so sorry. He didn't dare look at the baby. She's all right, Anne said. He took Jan's hand, and she gave a weak smile. I'm exhausted, she said. We're going to the hospital now, Anne said. I was going to ride with them in the ambulance, but now you're here, you can, and I'll follow in my car. She seemed very calm, Chris thought, and looked from her to the paramedics, not really understanding what was going on. There was no sign of horror on their faces, and Jan looked worn out but not distraught. We need to get going now, the paramedic holding the baby said. Go on, Chris, Anne told him. Go with Jan. He went to speak, but Anne said, It'll be fine. Your son was early, but the problem with his feet is no worse than expected. I'll explain at the hospital. She held his gaze. Chris nodded dumbly and followed the paramedics out of the room. They paused on the landing. If you could hold your baby, the paramedic said, turning to Chris, I can help carry the chair with your partner in downstairs. He placed the bundle into Chris's arms, but it was a moment before Chris dared look. The little face was slightly wrinkled from the birth, and his eyes were tightly closed. Premature but there was no excessive hair or unusual features. It's going to be okay, Anne said, quietly joining him. Just keep going.
Chapter 73 The journey in the ambulance to hospital seemed to take forever, Chris thought, although they were on a blue light. He sat on one of the seats opposite Jan, who was lying on the couch. He had Owen cradled in his arms, but he was concentrating on Jan. She was dozing, exhausted from the birth and from the pethidin Anne had given her. Chris sat in a trance, unable to take in what was happening. It was going to be okay, Anne had said. She was now in her car following the ambulance. Did that mean his baby was going to be able to live a normal life? He dared to hope. It can be a bit overwhelming to begin with, the paramedic riding with them said, seeing his expression. Is this your first child? Yes, Chris said quietly. Don't worry, your partner and baby are fine. He'll probably go into an incubator for a while. It's usual with Prems. Chris nodded. The paramedic had checked Jan's and Owen's vital signs and was now entering her observations on a chart. The sirens sounded to clear traffic, and then finally they were pulling into the ambulance park at Colshaw Hospital. The rear doors opened, and the paramedic who'd been driving appeared. Chris stayed where he was as they wheeled Jan out first. Then Anne appeared. Come with me, she told him. Chris stood, and carrying his baby went carefully down the rear steps of the ambulance, then followed the paramedics and Anne into the hospital. It was busy. I can take the baby through if you could register your partner and child at reception, the paramedic said to Chris. He looked back, unsure. Yes, of course, Anne replied, and touched his arm. This way. Still in a daze. Chris handed over his baby and went with Anne to reception. Jan Hamlin and baby Owen, Anne said to the receptionist, then gave their details. Anne had taken charge, and Chris was grateful. Thank you, the receptionist said once the registration was complete. You can go and see them now, straight down that corridor. She pointed in the direction they were to go, although Anne knew the way. They took a few steps away from reception and Anne drew Chris to one side. Before you see Jan, I need to tell you something. Chris stared back, petrified. Why? What's wrong? The baby is all right, normal, Anne said, her voice low. I've checked him over, so be careful what you say to the staff here. You mean he doesn't have the condition? Chris asked in disbelief. That's right. He's premature, but you've been lucky this time. He will need corrective surgery on his feet, but as far as I can tell, that's all that's wrong. Can't believe it, Chris said, his eyes filling. I really can't. Did you know, while Jan was pregnant? I dared to hope. I thought we were in with a chance, but I couldn't be certain until he was born, which is why I didn't say anything to you, in case I was wrong. And of course, Jan never knew about any of it. Thank goodness she was saved from all these months of worry, Chris sighed with relief. But she needs to know about the email, Anne said, her face serious. I kept quiet as you asked, but it's not right. Chris, you may not be so lucky next time. Apart from that, there's the moral issue of you two being related. You can't ignore it. Technically, you are half-brother and sister. Most couples parted once they knew. Ian and Emma did. Jan needs to be told. But I couldn't bear to lose her, Chris said. That's why I haven't told her. She's my life. It feels so right being with her. I can't tell her now and risk losing her. We have a child. You must, Anne said. She has to know. It's not right to keep it from her. Supposing you have another child, and it has the condition. We won't have any more children. Chris, I won't be part of your deception any longer. If you don't tell Jan, I will. Chapter 74 
Chris gazed lovingly at Owen, now awake in his crib. He was happy and contented, even though both his legs were in plaster. Jan was sitting on the sofa, talking to him as he grinned and gurgled. At eight weeks old, he was steadily putting on weight and meeting all of the developmental milestones. The consultant paediatrician had said that surgery probably wouldn't be necessary, and Owen's legs could be straightened using manipulation and plaster casts, which was a huge relief. Chris knew how lucky they'd been, but Anne's words were constantly in his thoughts. He hadn't told Jan yet, and he needed to. Anne had given him an ultimatum. Tell Jan by the end of the weekend, or I will. It was Sunday evening now, and he was running out of time. He didn't blame Anne. She was doing what she thought was right. If Jan wasn't told and they had another baby, as she wanted to, it could have the condition. But he dreaded losing her, which he feared would happen when she found out they were related. Aware that he couldn't put it off any longer, Chris steeled himself and went over and sat on the sofa beside Jan. She turned to look at him and smiled. Chris took her hand. You know how much you both mean to me, how much I love you. Yes, of course, she laughed. I love you too. He hesitated and took a deep breath, summoning his courage. Jan, there's something I have to tell you, something that I should have told you much sooner. Her face immediately grew serious. What is it, Chris? She took her hand away. You're not having an affair. No, of course not. Nothing like that. He hesitated again. You remember I told you about Ian Jennings, in connection with the Moller Clinic? He emailed all those on Moller's list to warn them they could be affected and tell them to get their DNA checked? Yes, vaguely, but what's that got to do with us? You were on that list, Jan. You received an email, but it went to your old email address. What? How do you know? I looked at your laptop, I'm sorry, but I needed to check. Your parents must have used the Moller Clinic. I've been worried sick all these months. Owen is going to be okay, but any future children we have could be affected. Also, and this is the most difficult part, it means that biologically we're half brother and sister. I'm so sorry, Jan. I should have told you sooner, but I couldn't risk losing you. He looked at her with pain and misery, expecting the worst. Tears, cries of anguish and utter rejection. Yet she remained calm, composed and cool, which seemed even worse. What was she thinking? What would she say and do? That's a lot to take in, she finally said. Did Anne know all this time? I guess she did. Yes, I'm sorry. She wanted me to tell you straight away. I made her promise not to. But she says she can't live with the lie any longer and you must know. I'm scared of losing you, Jan. I love you so much. I couldn't face life without you. He tried to read her expression, but it was impossible. It was very wrong of you not to tell me, she said at last. Yes, I know. I'm so sorry. It was also wrong of you to look at my emails without me knowing. I trusted you. Yes, but you can see why I did it, can't you? He asked in desperation. A little, I suppose. Even so. You won't leave me, will you? He cried. He took her hand again. Not all couples like us have separated. We can stay together, but we won't have any more children. I know we share the same biological father, but it's not like we were brought up as brother and sister, so it's not immoral. You won't leave me, will you? He said again. No, Jan said. I won't leave you. He hardly dared to believe. Thank you, thank you so much. I'll make it up to you, I promise. I won't ever hide anything from you again. Good. But if you and Anne had told me sooner, I could have saved you both a lot of worry. There's something you don't know. What do you mean? He asked apprehensively. 
that email was only partially correct. My parents did use the Moller Clinic, but I've checked, and it was definitely to conceive my older brother, not me. Mum miscarried that baby at sixteen weeks, and then they had me naturally. Moller must have assumed I was his, or Ian made a mistake. We're not related, Chris. He stared at her, astounded. Are you sure? Yes. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to worry you unnecessarily with talk of the clinic after all you've been through. So we can stay together and have another child. But if you snoop in my emails again, I won't forgive you. She kissed his cheek. Now you'd better tell Anne and put her out of her misery. I will. Although this book is fiction, atavism exists, and this story was inspired by true events. A number of clinics offering donor insemination have been discovered to be using only one donor, that of the founder of the clinic. That was The Cottage by Lisa Stone, read by Jess Whittaker, produced by White House Sound. It was an audiobook from One More Chapter, a division of HarperCollins. Text copyright 2021. Production copyright 2021 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Lisa Stone asserts the moral right to be identified as the author of this work. Thank you for listening.